It's a true privilege to be here um, on this beautiful Sabbath day with you. There's just something so refreshing, right, about pausing and just lingering in God's presence and just taking a, a deep cleansing breath and knowing that as his spirit moves among us here, that we are free to worship. And so this morning, my prayer is that we would sense his spirit and hear his words. So there are a couple of things that are very clear about us humans. We have priorities, first of all. And these priorities shape our lives in very significant ways. We decide what is important, what is a priority in our life, in our personal life, and for our family. And we work around those priorities, and so they shape us. They form who we are. And secondly, whether we realize it or not, we also seem to have our own personal and unique understanding of who God is. In essence, we could say that we have our own theology about God. The way we live our life, our religious faith, the way that we practice and experience our religion, our, our faith, um, also shapes our lives in very, very significant ways. In fact, the word theology is made up of two Greek words. The first part of that word is theos, which means God. And the second part of that word means logos, which really means words. So really, our theology is words about God. So we can say that we all have our own theology so to a certain extent. The way we understand God at its very core, at its very foundation, theology makes a statement about God or its words about God. Theology is your understanding of God. Some people may view God as a merciful, benevolent, kind God. Others may view God as a distant, uncaring God who allows random things to happen in the universe without control or without his intervention. Your understanding of God, your theology, contributes to your formation. Your theology and what you think of God has a profound influence on the way you live your life. It shapes your life in very significant ways. So when I was little, my mom made sure that my brother and I went to Mass every Sunday. Adventism was not our faith tradition when I was growing up. I have vague memories of walking into a cool kind of dark, very reverent place. The pews were wooden, hard floors. It was the kind of place that you had to tiptoe into. I have vague memories of burning candles at the back of the church and a very strong smell of incense. Those are my memories, my childhood memories of church. I remember on a wall there was a large statue, a big statue of Jesus hanging on a cross with painted droplets of blood coming from a crown of thorns and blood painted on his hands and feet. So for a five-year-old, God was a bit scary. In the mind, in the literal mind of a little kid, there was an awe and a mystery and a certain sense of fear about God and church. This was my understanding of God at that time. You could say my theology. The way in which we each understand God determines the way we live, the way we serve, the way we treat each other. And interestingly, throughout the pages of Scripture, we will find that God makes many attempts 
to make himself known. He shares his priorities, his heart with us. The desire of his heart seems to be sprinkled throughout the pages of the biblical narrative. His plans and hopes for mankind, for humanity, are recorded in the pages of the Bible. You see, when you know God, your theology aligns with God's priorities. You'll know what it truly means to serve and to love your neighbor because when you see another human being you cannot help but see the sacredness of god in each person so if you think about it this sanctuary is beautiful it's filled with all of you but i it is filled with the sacredness of god as you are each we are each created in his image think about that let that simmer for just a little bit. Because this is have, going to have a huge impact not only in how we see and treat each other, but also about how we serve one another. I would go as far as to say that I believe that serving and loving God and loving others are God's core values. So this begs the question, are God's core values my core values? Are they my priorities? And how does this shape my life? Values are those things that cannot be compromised. They are undebatable truths that drive and direct behavior. They're motivational. These values give us the reason for why we do or we don't do things. Values are those things that are important and guide us and direct us. Uh, before I came into full-time ministry, I spent 26 years in the business sector and middle management. Our mission statement and values in our organization were very, very important. Business organizations, benefit from knowing and living their core values. So there are values such as honesty, integrity, dignity, honor. In business, core values are an organization's essential and enduring tenets. And so when Pastor Salajan invited me today and shared the vision for what is happening here, I have to say I was a little excited because I love this fourfold expression of your mission statement. To know Jesus, ah, that's beautiful, and to make him known, beautiful. And the ways that you choose to do this make so much sense through connection, growth, service, and mentorship. The great violinist Niccolo Paganini, he willed his violin to Genoa, his city of birth, but only under one condition. He said, you can have my violin, but it must never be played. What he didn't understand, which was unfortunate, that the condition of the wood of his violin was one that if you don't touch it and use it, it decays. And his violin ended up in its case. And before anybody knew, the wood in the case began, it was eaten by worms. And, and this beautiful violin, this mellow-toned violin had become worm-eaten in its beautiful case, valueless and just a relic. And this moldering instrument is a reminder that life withdrawn from service loses its value it loses its meaning so today i want us to shift a little bit i want us to take a little bit of a deep dive i invite you to take this deep dive with me into a well-known story in the old testament one i think that we're all familiar with and it's a story found in second kings chapter five so your homework for this afternoon or this evening or sometime this week is to read this chapter of second kings chapter five and i can almost guarantee that every little kid sitting here in this sanctuary who attends sabbath school knows the story of captain naaman and the little maiden girl in his home it's important 
that we sanitize the story for the sake of our kids and their developmental stages. But this morning, I want to share a little bit more because there's so much more to this story and the biblical narrative that paints a larger picture, a larger portrait of the amazing ways that God shows up to spectacularly rewrite a story of tragedy and loss through the spirit of service. So let's read the account found in 2 Kings chapter 5, and I think I'm going to just do verses 1 through 5, and it says the following. I think we have it up on a slide. It says, the king of Aram had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a, a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. Some uh, uh, versions say he suffered from a skin disease. At this time, Aramean raiders had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. One day, the girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go see the prophet in Samaria. He would heal him of his leprosy. So this morning, I want to invite you to journey with me to 9th century B.C., to get a little more of the historic flavor, a flavor that impacts how we understand this first part of Naaman's story and his relationship with this little unknown girl. Naaman was the commander of this army, the Syrian army. It was also considered part of the Syrian kingdom. He was highly respected. Naaman was not only brave, a brave and an honorable soldier, but he was an intelligent strategist. He had given victory to Syria and had made his commander-in-chief look pretty good. He was the confidant of the king and a person of influence and prestige. Naaman had a lot going for him, but what he had against him was devastating. He had a skin disease that was believed to be leprosy. Being a leper meant that you had a horrible, incurable disease that would slowly result in death. And no matter how successful everything else in Naaman's life was, he was a leper. And no amount of influence or prestige could heal him of his leprosy. I was going to bring you a picture of leprosy, but it was way too disgusting to look at, especially before lunch. So I thought I won't do that to you all. But Clark's commentary describes leprosy this way. It says the an ancient leprosy, okay, and I'm sorry if this is a little disgusting, but ancient leprosy began as small red spots on the skin. Before too long, the spots got bigger and started to turn white with a sort of shiny, scaly appearance. And pretty soon the spots spread over the whole body and then hair began to fall out from the head and even from the eyebrows. And as things got worse, fingernails and toenails became loose. They started to, they start to rot and eventually fall off. Then joints of fingers and toes begin to rot and fall off piece by piece. Imagine that. Gums begin to shrink and the teeth would fall out. So each of, they would lose their teeth. And leprosy kept eating away at the face until literally the nose, the palate, and even the eyes rotted. And the victim wasted away until death. That, my friends, was a picture of leprosy in biblical times. We don't exactly know how advanced the disease was for Naaman, but the reality is if that disease continued to advance, Naaman would soon have to step down from his position of honor and power. And essentially, he would be an outcast from society. And it was during this time, all of this was happen, happening when the Syrian armies were conducting uh, military patrols and raids into Israel. And these raids resulted in death and devastation. Often they were carried out for the purpose of looting and bringing back slaves. 
And the history books tell us that the Syrians were ruthless warriors. They killed without mercy and they kidnapped the young. Now just take a moment to imagine what this poor kid, this poor little girl went through. What she had to endure. Her life was a tragedy. She had been kidnapped. She had been abducted. And there was no Amber Alert. There was no calling Child Protective Services to come in for the rescue. There was none of that. She had been kidnapped. And it's very likely that her parents may have been murdered and that she may have been abused. She was taken from her home, homeland to a pagan culture, to a place that was foreign, unknown to her. She was taken to a place where everything was different. Her captors had different customs. They worshipped pagan gods. She was enslaved and forced to serve in the home of the commander of her captors. When we analyze this story, we may find some flavors of Daniel's story of captivity in Babylon. But her story is a bit different. If you try to imagine a person on the lowest rung of the social ladder in the ancient Near East, you couldn't get much lower than her. She is a young female slave in a male-dominated society. She is a stranger in a foreign land. She has no value. She has no voice. She holds no power or prestige. Nevertheless, it is this unnamed little girl who holds the key to turn this story around. And I love this again underscoring the ways in which God often operates, the unexpected. This kid, this little girl, she has every right to hate these people, to feel that a certain form of divine justice has been carried out as Naaman would now know real suffering. He would know what that suffering would be like. And because of his skin disease, he would be at a social status that would be even lower than hers, that of a slave. He would be unclean. He would be an outcast. He would be the trash of society. How ironic. What sweet revenge. But this story takes an interesting detour for those who are thirsty for justice and revenge. Because when God dwells in the depth of our soul, when he takes up residence in our heart, the response and the reaction are so very different from what might be expected. This young girl from Israel responded to Naaman's need with kindness and compassion passion and a heart for service this doesn't make sense it feels and seems illogical in spite of the horrific things that she may have lived she responded with grace and mercy she could have ignored the drama that Naaman was living. She could have said, hey, not my problem. It's not my deal to, to think about or deal with. But it is her heart, her heart for service, that prompts her to respond, to act, to speak. I wish my master would go see the prophet in Samaria. He would heal him. She knows about the ministry of Elisha. And she also knows about the powerful God of grace and love. And she sticks her neck out, not knowing, not 
having a definitive knowledge that Elisha will in fact heal Naaman. Yet she dares to hold on to her belief in a powerful God. And in the midst of her own human tragedy, she remains faithful to God. And she saw this opportunity to serve. She saw an opportunity to help. In the midst of her horrible, tragic life, she said, I can help. I can do something. I can create change. I can help someone. She may not have understood all that was happening in her life or what her future held. She simply reached out to help, to serve, to serve the enemy of her people when everything around her seemed cruel and unfair this disempowered unknown little girl shows up in a big way her heart is still pounding with the heartbeat of god she speaks god's native tongue she aligns with his core values and his heart so mercy service and grace just overflow and spill out you can only imagine how desperate Naaman was and how desperate his situation was that all of a sudden he takes this, the words of this young slave kid in his house and he goes running to his king to tell him almost verbatim what this little girl had said to him. The Syrian king listens to Naaman. Everybody's listening to this slave girl all of a sudden. And the king is like, yeah, man, I'm going to help support you in your healing. You know, maybe if I send a letter with you to the king of Israel, an introduction letter, um, and, and we send with you all of these opulent goods, a treasure trove of goods, a talent, a talent, the heaviest unit of measure for weight in the Bible, equal to about 75 pounds. Along with silver, there's 6,000 pieces of gold and 10 sets of clothing yeah clothing didn't seem like a big deal but back then clothing was considered um, a garment that was made it was it was very costly to make a garment when you think about the shearing of the wool the spinning the weaving the sewing clothes were a valued commodity in the ancient near east and the king of syria and naaman himself they somehow assume that um this that they need to bring all these goods all of these expensive things because this prophet of great renown would likely be part of the royal court in israel and would require this costly tribute so naaman starts on his journey to seek healing with this opulent treasure and the letter from his king israel of course did not trust the Syrians. So when the king of Israel gets this letter, he tears his clothes and he said, what is this? How can they think that, that we can bring healing to this leper? This is a trick. The king of Syria is really trying to pick a fight with me or raid us or go to war with us. So the king is just a, in an emotional mess. To the extent that Elisha finds out that the king is in distress, and I love what Elisha sends back to the words that he says to the king. Why are you so upset? In other words, why are you an emotional mess? Send Naaman to me. Just send him my way. Again, again, the expectations of the rich and powerful are upended. The prophet Elijah is not part of a royal anything not part of a royal court in fact the scene that follows is not without a little bit of humor because naaman the mighty man of syria rides up to elisha's humble abode in the barrio and shows up with his chariots and horses both instruments of war and so picture the moment elisha pulls up to elisha's humble home wondering my goodness why does this man not live in a classier neighborhood 
And so imagine what that must have been like. The um, Eugene Peterson in the Message Bible says that Naaman arrived in style. So he pulls up and he's probably wondering why, you know, this man doesn't roll out the red carpet for him or, or he's expecting some kind of spectacular or, or, or dramatic pronouncement, right? And so maybe the prophet will come out to greet him and, and, and do some kind of a, a magic a thing or an incantation perhaps he'll sacrifice a couple of animals and demand that his god heal his leprosy but very contrary to expectations the prophet doesn't even bother to come out he doesn't even show up at his porch he sends a messenger to go tell him go wash in the jordan and your flesh will be restored, and you will be clean. Naaman then proceeds to throw an adult tantrum. It's evident Naaman was so upset by what he perceived to be such an anemic reception. He was expecting the prophet to play pomp and circumstance. He expected the, maybe the prophet should come out and curtsy or bow before. What an insult that this famous prophet doesn't even come out to meet him. And he sends a messenger to go have him wash in, in these muddy backwaters of a river. The prophet's actions and posture in this in this scene align with the biblical theme of overturned expectations and thwarted pride and it is Naaman's pride that is almost his downfall his wounded pride almost had him back on his chariot and headed back home in a huff and it is only the advice of a servant that brings him to his senses, the real power, friends, and the core of this story doesn't lie in royal courts, in military might, political influence, or great wealth, which, by the way, Elisha rejects. The real power in this story lies with God, the God whom Elisha serves, the God of that unnamed, unknown little girl. That little girl that had been ripped away from the safety of her home and taken captive. We know how the rest of the story goes. Naaman dips in the Jordan seven times and he's miraculously healed. He declares that the God of Israel is the one true God. And throughout scripture, this God works in the most unexpected ways, though un through unexpected people, through ordinary people like you and me. He works through us. He works through people who see every opportunity to serve as a way of life, no matter what our journey is or what our circumstances are. He works through people. A life of service becomes our identity, part of our DNA. And in doing so, in accepting this, then the, then the God then turns the world unexpectedly upside down. He turns our expectations and systems upside down. And this is the biblical witness of true power. See, the hero of this story is God. God is always the hero of the story. The way in which we understand God will determine how we live, the way we live and how we treat one another. God living in our heart and dwelling in the core of this little girl's heart and soul is what now in this story makes her a hero too. Her intervention had international consequences. The good news about the God of Israel became known. It made its way into the ranks of the Syrian army from top to bottom. How do we define service? How do we see the people of this world? How do we serve one another? How do we treat one another as brothers and sisters? 
Do we show compassion and yearn to help and serve? We don't have the power to fix everything, but we can serve those around us, even if it's something little. It may have huge consequences that we don't even see. All this little girl said is that there is someone out there who can help you. That's such a little thing, but it had such a huge effect. When we seek to serve, we gain a broader perspective that is beyond just our own life, our own circle. This little girl saw Naaman not necessarily as the enemy, but as someone whom God had called her to serve. I recently heard a story that touched me. There was an era of missionary zeal. And there's a, I have a picture of this that we can show up on the screen. This happened around the turn of the 20th century where passionate servants of God became known as one-way missionaries. They gave up everything. They gave their all to share the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ with people who had no knowledge of God. When they departed for the mission field, they, packed, they would pack all of their belongings in a coffin. Why? Because they felt that their life was all about service. And they would give their entire life to serve in the mission field. And they knew that the only way they would come back home would be in a coffin. Peter Milne was one of those missionaries. He felt called to a tribe of headhunters in the New Hebrides, a group of 11 main islands, 69 islets, east of New Guinea in the same chain as the Solomons. The islands are mountainous and covered with a thick mantle of jungle which runs straight down into the ocean. All the other missionaries to this tribe had been martyred. But Peter didn't shrink back into comfort. He decided that these people needed to know Jesus and that he was determined to serve them with passion, humility, and love. And he did this for more than 50 years. He became one of them. He broke bread with them. He loved them. He served them. He shared Jesus with them. When Peter died of natural causes, the tribe honored him and they buried him there. And they wrote this message on his tombstone that said, when he came, there was no light. When he left, there was no darkness. What an incredible inscription of someone's life. Imagine what the church would look like today if every single follower of Christ returned to this spirit of service and loving others the way God loves us, of missional living, living in the spirit of Jesus himself. What if we lived in the reality of God's priorities, love and service, plain and simple? What if we intentionally, intentionally sought out to love our neighbors, invite them to our dinner tables, live in missional community with others, serve the marginalized, and follow God wherever he may lead for his glory. What might the world see in the Laguna Niguel Seventh-day Adventist Church if we became those one-way missionaries right here where we live, in our neighborhood, in our church, and in our community? May God bless you.